Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Talking Sound Podcast. Chris Jordan, your host here, still coming to you from Austin, Texas, soon to be coming to you from the road with, you know, episodes of secret snacks, all kinds of fun stuff. I cannot wait to be back on the road with work. The world has slowly started to reboot for our industry. Speaking of industry, we have an amazing guest today, Carl Winkler is our guest he is the vp of sales and marketing for electrosonics electrosonics is one of the world's best when it comes to wireless technology for theaters broadcast i know i've i've got an elect electrosonics uh ifb r1a very venerable unit used for uh in-ear monitoring things like this in broadcast Uh, live for reporters that kind of stuff this is what i use in the field to be able to monitor my audio so uh we're going to be getting into the world of in-ears the world of radio frequencies and all kinds of fun toys that electrosonics makes for the industry when we come back from this message from our sponsor podcast cadet Have you considered starting a podcast? Looking for a way to make your business a voice of authority in an industry? Then Podcast Cadet is the solution for you. Whether starting a podcast for yourself, your brand, business, school, church, or just plain fun, Podcast Cadet is here to help you navigate the waters of the podcast industry. Specializing in one-on-one consultation and training with industry professionals in fields ranging from podcast technology and editing to distribution, monetization, and even social media strategies. Podcast Cadet tailors their services to the specific needs of you and your podcast. Do you already have a podcast and trying to find ways to engage and grow your audience? Sign up for your Podcast Cadet audit today. And let us help you explore new and exciting ways to leverage your content and elevate your podcast brand to whole new levels. From consultation and workshops to affordable podcast production and maintenance packages, Podcast Cadet is your one-stop shop for everything podcast-related on the internet. Visit podcastcadet.com today to sign up for your consultation or training. And use code TALKING20 to save 20% off your entire purchase. That website, again, is podcastcadet.com. That's right, folks. And while you are online checking out Podcast Cadet, make sure to stop on by the Talking Sound Podcast. We will soon be rebooting our industry news section. Uh, Some of the manufacturers that we had on there actively stopped putting out RSSs uh, with news over the COVID era. Um mainly because of shortages. A lot of companies weren't putting things out for a while uh, because of chip shortages, things like that. So uh, we will be rebuilding the industry news section. But in addition to that, make sure to stop on by our other sponsor, True Hemp Science. True Hemp Science is some of the best CBD product I have found. Uh, My doctor started prescribing me CBD as a supplemental for my anxiety a few years ago when I started traveling for work regularly. And that is when I found Christopher Lynch here in Austin, Texas, the founder of True Hemp Science. They have some of the best whole plant CBD out there. I use it daily. Stop on by. TrueHempScience.com is the website. Talking7 is the code that you want to use to save 7% off your cart of $50 or more. And on your way out the door, you will get two, count them, two free 25 milligram CBD edibles. TrueHempScience.com, Talking7 is the code that you want to use. Our guest today, VP of Sales and Marketing, Carl Winkler with with Electrosonics. How are you doing today, sir? Uh, Doing well, Chris, and uh, thanks for having me on the show. Oh, absolutely. I've been looking forward to this since our mutual friend and former guest of the show, uh, Willis Snow, introduced us. Um, And... Like I said in the intro, I've been using Electrosonics for years. Not too many people 
I, I think it's interesting how in the broadcast world, in the world of high-end theater, things like that, it's a, it's a household name. Um, but in the world of rock and roll, things like that, not necessarily so much. Yeah, very true. You know, we've got a long history in broadcast, long history in film, sound, production. Um, and, you know, we are known in live sound in certain circles. Mm. You know, most of the systems guys know about our TM400 link for test and measurement when they're aligning sound systems. Yep. Uh, that's been out for about 15 years, and it's kind of a standard. The speaker companies know us well. Uh, and some guitar players, some of the heavy hitters have been using our stuff for a yeah. long time. Uh, so, but, you know, with some of the bigger names in the industry as more popular brands, you know, we're, we're, a, we're a less known brand for the actual performance side of, of uh, you know, the wireless audio. Well, and before we start getting into how y'all are changing that and how y'all are really bringing a whole new realm of technology to uh, the the gear that y'all have provided for years. Let's get into how you came into this industry to begin with, Carl, because uh, that's really a lot of what this show is about, is showing people that even folks like you who have moved up to VP of sales at a major tech company uh, in this field start off in the most basic of ways. Well, sure. I mean, my background, like many in the industry, uh, was as a musician. You know, I'm a classically trained violin and viola player. I got my degree in music performance. Uh, but along the way, I started becoming interested in audio. And I think that goes back to my dad was building Dynaco kits for our home stereo, you know, back in yeah, the late yeah. 70s. And and that fascinated me. I got interested in electronics. I was building projects, you know, all along and also listening to records and starting to think about the technology that went into making them and the fascinating uh, positions that might be out there. Uh, you know, like producer, uh, engineer, you know, what what are these guys, who are these people and, and what are they doing and how are they involved with making records? That was kind of how it started for me. That was the, the planting the seed, you know. And then when I was in college studying music, I started haunting the uh, recording studio and planning sessions and, you know, kind of writing some songs with my friends and we had a band and so we would go down there and record and I got more and more into the technical side, like many guitar players. I mean, I, I learned guitar just as a hobby for fun. And, uh, you know, you get obsessed with your tone and then the equipment and then, you know, you're experimenting with pickups and different kinds of tubes and you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, 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 we all kind of, I think so many people in this industry have histories like that. Um, so once I graduated with my music degree and I was working in a music store in Tucson and freelancing and um, I heard about the program at USC uh, that was recording arts and that I could apply my music degree and then take 100 percent you know recording classes and and get a certificate in a year which is what i did because that's all i could afford i mean usc is an extremely expensive school for good reason but uh so yeah that's where i went to audio school learn recording and my plan was to become a recording engineer and ultimately a producer uh, but you know the world was changing technology was changing in the 90s and yeah uh you know it was very hard to find work um you know, I didn't have a lot of, uh, let's say, backing or, you know, uh, subsidy, you know, to kind of just work for free. I had to make a living. Yeah. So I found out about an Air Force job uh, doing sound. Imagine that. So I uh, went and interviewed for that job, got the job and went out to Washington, D.C. and became a live sound engineer, which I, I had very little experience doing. So I kind of learned along the way and had mentors and people that helped me understand the differences between studio and live. But I think my studio experience uh, went a long way towards informing the way that I listened and the way that I approached mm -hmm. the signal chain. So I, I was always looking for the highest fidelity possible. Mm. And uh, in the 90s, that was still a little bit of a novel concept. I mean, I, if you, you think about the late, great Albert Lachesi, you know, his rules were, you know, number one, make sound. Number two, keep making sound. You know, that's the live sound thing you have to make sound and, and sound yeah. quality isn't necessarily at the top of the chain um but bringing all that together and using equipment at the time that was very high quality and sounded great like meyer msl3 speakers and oh wow you know we we had a nice mic locker with neumann sennheiser akg you know sure mics um and we could experiment a lot with what we put up on the stage and I, it was also um, very fortunate that I worked with a group 
called the Airmen of Note. This is an 18 piece big band. You know, uh, nothing wrong with rock and roll. I love rock and roll, but working with a, a true acoustic kind of band had a lot to do with how I began to approach live sound. You know, almost like make believe that the sound system isn't there and you're, you're just hearing this band, even in a giant auditorium, as clear as can be and with all the impact and all the dynamics that a big band can deliver on a stage. So that became my goal is to make the sound system disappear yeah. and just have people enjoy the experience. So, you know, it was a combination of that plus the studio background that kind of got me into that mode of thinking. Yeah, and, I, you know, I, I think more than anything out of the engineers that I have known over the years, those that come from the studio environment to the live sound environment, I think have a much greater understanding of the concept of, quote, live sound reinforcement mm -hmm, mm -hmm, yeah. than, than like mixing sheer volume. Yeah, that's an interesting <laughs> point. And, and I understand. I mean, you know, again, uh, I love great rock and roll mix and you know, I've heard some great bands out there live and, you know, have deep respect for the guys that came up that way and, and deliver just absolutely. And, you know, um, but I, I do think that when you're dealing with acoustic music, it's a, it's a specialty. It is. Um, and having learned, you know, classical recording and then doing this acoustic work on the stage and so on. You know, we were experimenting in those days in the 90s, which was kind of early with uh, system delay and things like trying to align the wave front coming off the band uh, mm. with the PA so that the PA didn't distract the listener and, you know, things like that. Yeah. And every time I encountered another uh, engineer who was doing kind of acoustic work like that, we'd pick each other's brain and share ideas and, you know, how did you do this? How did you do that? You know, uh, oh, well, we use this kind of mic and we put it here and we did this yeah. and then, you know, so it, it's that became a subset really of of the live sound world is people doing acoustic reinforcement. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, the the fact that you started like once again in the studio and then went with acoustic stuff like the airman of note um, really does speak volumes for the amount of detail that goes into mixing, especially whenever you're talking about brass that kind of stuff it can it can really yeah. pop out in a mix and like yes. you said it can can distract people if you have delay going on if you're hearing a horn before you hear it come out of the speakers yeah or, or vice versa i mean yeah and, and you know miking position you know in, in some cases was a little bit contentious with the players themselves because you know they wanted to blow right down the bore of, you know into a mic and get that really bright brassy you know, a sound, but to me, it mm. didn't sound very natural. So I was always looking for off axis mic positions to get more of the roundness, like what a horn sounds like in a room, as opposed to, you know, inches in front of a bell, which is nobody listens there. They listen, you know, yeah. back a ways and you hear the, the combination of the sound and all acoustic instruments are like that, you know, so that's the kinds of approach that we took. And, um, you know, it, it's, uh, it was a lot of fun. I got to hear some amazing jazz. We had incredible guest artists, you know, doing tours all over the U S we went to Japan. Uh, we did some recordings. We played at the, you know, some big events like the recreation of the Glenn Miller orchestra, you know, oh, big wow. 44 piece band that we took on the road across the U S you know, stuff like that. It was, it was really a blast and it really taught me a lot. And I mean, one of the things that taught me was troubleshooting like as fast as humanly possible. You know, the, yeah. <laughs> the, the curtain's going to open at eight o'clock and, you know, channel two on the console doesn't work and we're out of channels. And, you know, it's uh, learning how to identify hums and ground loops and fix that kind of stuff, distortion, you know, any kind of power problems. Yeah, uh, it, it was really an on the road, you know, on the job education, which I'm incredibly grateful for. Yeah, I. I I had the same kind of experience where I worked with the same sound system regularly in different locations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, yeah. and you really do once, once you have that wiring schematic in your head, um, troubleshooting becomes almost a ninja reflex. Like yes. It become, it becomes a second language to you. It's really, really interesting. Um, Absolutely. Because you kind of have the spare bandwidth in your brain. You already know where things are plugged in. Um, it's not like you just set it up for the first time or just took it off of a truck and you've never seen it before. Um, right, right. Which, of course, I mean, hey, we've all run those shows, too. Um, 
Right. Well, there's the coming into a place and you got your sound system, but you got to mm. tie into theirs because yep. of the balcony fills and that kind of stuff. And of course that brought in a whole new set of problems. You know, you do come in yeah. and they say, Oh yeah, we got a great sound system in here. You're going to love it. And you, you start patching up and start listening and you're like, well, wait a minute, this cluster over here is yeah. out of polarity and this one's high frequency drivers blown and this and that, you know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and the show's starting in two hours and 26 minutes and eight, you know, yeah, <laughs> eight yeah. seconds. <laughs> well, how did all of this prepare you for the world of electrosonics and how did you come into the world of electrosonics? Yeah, you know, it's a, another bit of a winding story, but when I was on the road, I kind of realized that I, I didn't think I was cut out to do that long term, you know, and I really admire those who do, you know, I've known so many guys over the yeah. years and and just think the world of it and and uh, but for me, I was thinking more along the lines like I was attracted to the equipment itself and I wanted to somehow be involved. It's like, you know, who hasn't thought about like a Sennheiser 421 clip and how it sucks and how you think you could do better. You know what I mean? Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. A lot of a lot of us, you know, why use duct tape, you know, when you could design a better clip. So I just kind of thought about um, the two things that were likely to be the most stable were uh, loudspeakers and microphones, you know, transducers. You, you always have to get the sound into electronic form and then turn it back into sound. So I thought, well, those, you know, physics limits those things. The stuff yes. in the middle, consoles, I could see, you know, on the horizon was digital. And same with recording, you know, coming up in the analog days. Yep. And, and I could see everything in between the mic and loudspeakers was completely up for grabs. So I thought, well, let me let me go look into... Uh, careers at at maybe a loudspeaker company, and I thought we use Meyer. I'll talk to Meyer, and they, they were very warm, and and it was interesting. But when I met the guys from Sennheiser, uh, I was attracted to that, um, and the the people there were super nice. And I've always loved microphones. It's just that's kind of at the heart of what I'm into. So I was able to get a job there, and I became the Neumann mic product manager, and uh, that was a fantastic time to be you know, at Neumann in the mid to late nineties. Wow. That's when we came out with the KMS 105, which I was involved with uh, the TLM 103, you know, some of the classics that really got Neumann out there on stages where we weren't before and things like that. Yeah. Um, but I had a good run there. I worked at, at Sennheiser doing Neumann and doing some other things for about eight years. Uh, but you know, I grew up in Albuquerque here and I kept my eye on this little company that I had run into when I worked in a music store, Electrosonics, you know, they had made, some portable guitar amps. They had made some interesting wireless stuff. And mm -hmm. so I thought, you know, I should go visit those guys and just see what they're up to these days. Uh, and so when I was on, I think I was home for spring break or something, and I just knocked on their door essentially and made an appointment. And they were very skeptical, like, why does a guy from Sennheiser want to come and bug us? You know, when, when, uh, but when I explained to them what I was thinking about, they they became interested. And so we worked out a position to kind of get me in the door, just a generic position to get me in there and start working on some projects. So I'm grateful to them to for you know giving me a shot. Um, and that was 2004. So I've been there 17 years. Hard to believe it's been that long. And um, but the company had been around since 1971. So you know it's a, got a good established history. But what I didn't know much about was wireless mics. Uh, Sennheiser is a powerhouse in wireless mics as well, yeah. uh, of course. And uh, but I didn't do much with that when I was there. It was almost all microphones and then you know marketing communications and things like that. So I had to start learning quickly about wireless because in a in a sense that's ninety percent of what Electrosonics does is wireless mics. Yeah. And uh, I'm fortunate to have you know some some industry folks take me under their wing, and of course the folks at Electrosonics and. I got a real quick education and then uh, got into this side of the business and learned about film sound and, you know, but I started looking at ways that the electrosonics technology could be used for live sound because that was my background. So, you know, that was where the interface really got, got going, I guess. So 2004, 2005, you know, I was looking at electrosonics has some unique technology and some patents and now an Academy Award for their technology. And so it was fun to, to look for ways to apply that to live sound. And I have always loved Electrosonics. Mainly, it's for me, it's the build quality. Um, yeah. It was one of the things that I always loved about Sennheiser microphones, specifically the EW Wireless series. 
Oh yeah, uh, that you see all over film sets all the time. I have like three of those, um, and they they were great kits that you could buy just about readily anywhere, like guitar centers, stuff like that. Carried That's them. Right. They had the the uh, dongle that you could plug straight into a microphone in some of the kits, um, and the the build quality on Electrosonics is what I'm about. Every even mm-hmm. the fact of on the back of this unit is literally engraved the instructions. Right. Yeah, that's the Hallmark Electrosonics for you there. And I think that comes from just the background and the way we do industrial engineering. Yeah. Um, but also it's a U.S. company and our factory is here. It's in Rio Rancho, New Mexico. Yep. It's the only factory. And so, you know, we say made in the USA by a bunch of fanatics. And it's really true. I mean, that this company is very passionate the mechanical engineering, you know, when I got here, it's like some stuff was famous. The battery doors, you know, the way they click shut and they're all made out of metal. They're machined out of billet. And that's, that's still what we do. Um, and it's, that was another thing that attracted me to the company was that I could walk up to the other building there on our little campus and walk into the machine shop and have a conversation with the guys and sketch something on a piece of paper and say, you know, I yeah. need this bracket, you know, to mount like a RF splitter on the back of my little rack. Can you make this? And you know, next morning I'd come in and there'd be a pair of them on my desk, you know, awesome. I mean, make it there. And these guys are really in, into this, you know, they're, yeah. everyone wants to do a great job and they want to contribute and, you know, comments end up com- coming up the chain. Like, you know, we're trying to make this part, but uh, the cutter that we have to use is this, this, and, you know, is there any way you could do it this way? And, you know, there's just so much collaboration. I, I really enjoy that. I'm a hands-on kind of guy. Um, and so I, I really love that part of it. Well, and it shows in everything that is made from you guys. Like you said, made by fanatics. Um, uh, the one of the only other companies that I know of that has the the stellar stellar customer service that you guys have, and just products along this line is uh, companies uh, that actively listen to engineers out in the field that use them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and make changes, even make software updates that are game-changing and make a difference. Uh, you guys and Rode Microphones. Interesting. Those, yeah, yeah, yeah. those are hands down the two that, like, whenever I'm putting things into forums, that kind of stuff, like, y'all actively listen. We, we work hard at that. It takes work. And, uh, you know, one of the interesting things that originally drew me to the company, and we still maintain this as part of our culture, you know, when I used to be involved with the rec.audio.pro forums and the so-called mm. ramps, you know, these were uh, news groups that kind of self-formed and I signed on the charter for ramps, you know, in the, in the late 90s. Um, I noticed that the company president of Electrosonics at the time would get into these forums and talk about things like the schematics and the topology of an input. You know, people would say, oh, I'm, I'm hearing this sound using my Sennheiser G2, you know, transmitter or whatever. He would get in there and say, well, in, in the input of that unit, uh, it's this kind of circuit. It's like, yeah, that, that just blew me away. This, this is the president of the company. And so I thought, wow. So rather than have like, let's say, a, a lot of overhead, a lot of admin, mm. you know, this is a company that's made up of people that are actually doing this stuff. And that, that really attracted me. And it's still that way. I mean, our company president today, Gordon Moore, is very active on social media as well as you know, he's the head of audio at his church and he's, you know, he's also coming up with ideas for products and listening to people and going out to these, these get togethers. There's a thing in the film world called the mixer mixer where, you know, production Mm. sound mixers have a little get together, a little barbecue. He'll go to those things and pick people's brain and hear their complaints and come back, you know, with new ideas. We all do that. Uh, The company has only four layers between president and a shipping clerk. You know, yeah. and wow. so there's a lot of communication and wow. collaboration, but you know, it, it's that an involvement with the actual customers going on site, listening yep. to their issues. Um, and yeah, firmware. I mean, people have been just flabbergasted that they'll say, you know, your wireless design or software program. The one thing I'd love to do is, is have zones as an example. This is something just from a few months back. And it's like, yeah, you know, we've been meaning to do that. Let's do that. So then you know, a few weeks later, we, here's a beta version. Let's get that out there. Mm-hmm. People are like, really? So we asked for zones and, and you, you did it? You know, <laughs> yeah, we did it. I mean, yeah. in a sense, you could say, how else would we survive? You know, 
uh, we, we need to be flexible. We need to be hearing their input and, and putting these features in. And uh, although one thing that I find somewhat humorous, you know, these days with smartphones and tablets and things like that, that are essentially a blank slate device with a touch screen and, a, and then a bunch of apps, right? So it's, it's essentially whatever it does is all software. Yeah. Um, so people believe that anything can be done with software, which isn't really true. You know, there, there are hardware limitations. Um, but so it's just become that kind of world though, where it's like, well, why can't it do blank? You know, uh, can't you just program that? Well, no, <laughs> Yeah. you know, there's only so many channels of A to D and D to A in a unit and things like that. Um, so, it, but it's, it makes it exciting and challenging. That's for sure. Well, yeah. And it, it makes for unique problem solving, uh, as well. Whenever, whenever, like you said, you, you get together with, your chip manufacturers, your president who obviously knows these kind of things. Um, yes. And it's so important that somebody that high up knows that in depth the product that they are dealing with. Yes. Um, and much. the technology that they're dealing with because it's so frequently it is the case and you see it with so many manufacturers in this industry where the CEO, the person at the top has no idea like they don't play synthesizers what right what why are they in charge of yamaha you know I, I think to some extent you get a company that large and, and that's kind of how it has to be you, you have to have administrators and their their big skill or their you know what they bring to the table is managing people and who they're managing are yep. really you know smart capable and, people and so on but yeah I, you know i think to a certain extent that in some cases, they even take pride in, you know, I don't even know quite what we do, but, you know, we've got experts on that. Kind but of we got we got tons of people that take care of that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 but you know. but the, the interesting difference, though, I think, Carl, is that whenever you look at a lot of those products, like I, uh, I do a lot of podcasting, obviously, um, and advise a lot of people on podcasting. And uh, so many people are addicted to Zoom. And mm -hmm. yeah. I have I have tried to steer so many people away from it. Um, it's a decent product, but it's one of those. Um, I tend to go with companies like Electrosonics or Tascam. You know, um, companies that have done that one thing, and that's what they've done. Yeah, and they don't they don't need to make a video recorder for bands. They don't need to make microphones. They don't they, like they make recorders. Right. That's right. what Tascam does. They they make recorders and they make mixing consoles. It's all they've ever done. Um, so it's it's a purpose built company. It's not something that gets so scattered and I think has kind of that panic mentality of, oh look, there's a product, let's make it. Oh look, there's a product, let's make it. Um, yeah, I'm it, a big believer in focus. It it, and, it yeah. tends to affect quality. It tends to affect the usability of the product. Um, you aren't necessarily like a road um, focusing in on on that bandwidth with the direct user. And what are you updating? What are you changing? What are you making sure that is done properly? And once again, that's one reason why I've always used Electrosonics for my my wireless in-ear stuff mm -hmm. uh, yeah. on the road because that that's what we used in broadcast that is what they do <laughs> yeah we don't i mean we have a pretty limited portfolio when you really boil it down and a limited but beautiful yeah. portfolio yeah it's got to be uh curated cu cultivated i mean mm -hmm. um, one of the challenges is being as small as we are and going up against much larger competitors we have to be good at this yeah. And that is, is never easy. It's a lot of work uh, coming up with unique product ideas. You know, that's really, really important. You know, it's like if we started doing Me Too stuff, uh, you know, the big competitors would eat us alive. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, it's but we, we can do unique things because of our size. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not publicly traded. Uh, you know, we're privately held. And so we can you know, kind of put a pitch to the shareholders and say, look, we want to do this. It's going to take a couple of years and you need to be patient, but we're going mm -hmm. to win. We're going to win when we get there. And as long as we do that more often than not, you know, they let us do it. 
And uh, that, that's great. I mean, we're a company with 140 employees. That, that's just tiny, wow. you know, and that's it. manufacturing. I mean, everything. Um, so it, that's what we're constantly thinking and talking about. You know, how do we do stuff that is unique and provides a, a powerful solution or elegant solution for professionals? That's the other part that we, we really don't make any consumer products or any yeah. pr- uh, mid-fi, pro-fi, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, it, it's pro only. Uh, which makes it narrow in terms of the price range. Um, but I would say that where a lot of larger companies have uh, vertical differentiation, you know, between their lines, they've got a, let's say a, a wireless at $400 and a wireless at 800 and a wireless at 1200 and so on. You know, we only make one quality level. It's pro. Uh, some of the products have less features and maybe a little less expensive, but when everything's made in the U S to a pro level of quality, you know, it's not inexpensive. And uh, yes. that's, you know, because of that, we're not available in music stores. We don't really do endorsements. You know, there's a lot of things we don't do that larger yep. companies do and can do and need to do. Uh, we just focus on the products and, yeah. and, and the tight customer relationships. Well, and, and on an industry and the needs of an industry, uh, when you're talking about broadcast, film, theater, the, those needs are pretty specific. They are, you know, um, it's not like rock and roll where you, you need it to be able to be handled in, in the rain while you're, while you're swapping guitars out and jumping off truss, you know, um, like that, that's not what you're doing. (laughs) And I mean, that's not our focus. That's true. Yeah. And, and even then most of those products, um, have an extreme what I would consider to be a fairly limited lifespan. Um, most of the transmitters, receivers, things like that. I mean, the, a lot of the newer sure stuff, things like that have definitely come into, into a much better realm, but they don't seem to have the ruggedness and the road, uh, the road life that Mm -hmm. my, my electrosonic units have had. Um, the bands that I've worked with that have had wireless in-ear units, things like that. Um, like well, I said, I mean, I've, to, I've used this even for yeah. live soundboards for years to be able to walk around the room, stuff sure. like that. That's right. No, I mean, it, it's uh, maybe not obvious to those that, that uh, don't know behind the scenes of broadcast and filmmaking and so on. Um, and, and I would say this too, it's one of the, you know, we, for a long time we were, kind of known as you know the best kept secret in the industry it's like the the, the pros knew about us but uh you know not publicly known and some of that's because our stuff's almost always hidden you know when you see a movie uh yeah. you, you never see the transmitter and the lav mic and the receiver and all any of that you never see that on yeah. rock and roll you do uh you know singers you see the mic they've got in their hand um but the ruggedness required is definitely there the stuff gets put to the test constantly in a lot of different ways environmental uh and longevity and you know conditions like is it cold is it hot is it humid is it you know all those things any any way that films are made uh this stuff is there and it's got to survive that it's got to last and like you said i mean i I think because of the structure of filmmaking and broadcast you know a lot of times these are freelancers that invest in their equipment and they need a solid return on their investment which means the stuff's got to last a while you know, they don't want to buy it and then have it be outdated in three years. That, exactly. That's just not how to do it. Uh, they want it to last six to eight to 10 years to make sure that they've got a return on their investment. Yeah. So we design for that. We design for long-term use. And oftentimes in the life of a product, I mean, we've got products that have lasted more than 15 years in the market. Uh, and they've had a number of updates along the way, hardware and software. You know, sometimes it's because a chip gets obsolete and we have to redesign around that sometimes it's around suggestions like i mentioned before sometimes it's well now that we've seen it out there for all this time we realize that the battery door is going to start failing in in such and such manner Mm. so we tighten that up too and redesign it and you know implement the new design and oftentimes you know we, we work really hard to for mechanical updates like that to be backwards compatible like if we make a new battery door we want it to still fit on the existing units things like that. So yeah, um, it, it's a certain kind of culture and, and philosophy of the company, which resonates well with me. And I think with our customers, 
Uh, but, well, because it takes your customers and end users into into consideration. It's not the fact of they they've got to buy something whole and new and complete. You know, uh, uh, very true. In fact, a, a big part of our philosophy is backwards compatibility, and yeah, that becomes an enormous challenge. I mean. The first time it was really done was in the early 2000s with the introduction of the digital hybrid wireless platform, which is still in our line. And that's what we got an Academy Award for. Yep. Uh, but the idea was that with a new kind of technology and it's patented, uh, we would not only be able to deliver better sound quality and better range with the wireless, but that the new units would be backwards compatible. Both transmitters and receivers could be put in different modes and be used for different things like a belt pack transmitter that normally would be used on a talent uh, could be put into IFB mode and transmit to one of your IFB receivers to act as like a portable IFB transmitter, wow. you know, things like that, just that yeah. kind of flexibility. But the main idea at the beginning was that we would not alienate the people that had invested significantly in the prior series, you know, That's which right. was the 200 series, which was, you know, the bees knees of analog wireless at its during its day, you know, the idea that, Hey, people have invested thousands of dollars into, uh, this 200 series equipment, which is fantastic equipment. So now they can get the new 400 series hybrid stuff and still use their old transmitters and make a much more gradual uh, transition into the newer gear. That has worked wonders, I think, with people's confidence in us that whatever they buy, it's never going to be left out yeah. in the cold when there's a new version. So we, we always design to go back at least one, if not two generations before. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's pretty unique, I think. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's absolutely unique. I mean, I don't I don't know of another manufacturer uh, that does that. I mean, even with connector types, right? Yeah, true, even true. even with power supplies, yeah. You know, um, and and that's one of the things that's so great about you guys is that y'all y'all highly highly take that into consideration because without that customer loyalty, without that brand and industry loyalty, um, where would you be? You know? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's every brand is a is a collection of factors, you know, collection of experiences mm -hmm. that the customers have along with your equipment, along with your people. But it's like that's what we strive to maintain is this brand means this to these people, to our customers, to the industry. And, you know, honestly, it'd be a lot easier for our engineers if we didn't do that. Uh, you know, if they were able to design freely. Uh, with with no backwards compatibility, they, yeah. they would enjoy that. Um, but they know well, and we all do, that it has to be that way uh, because of the installed base. Tens of thousands of units are out there. Uh, yeah. We want people to continue using them as long as they can. And, you know, we see stuff in repair that's 15, 20, 25 years old or older. Yeah. Uh, and people are still using it. Uh, so that's ex that makes us proud. And, of course, it's like, well, you know, there's also the the hawks that think, well, if it didn't last so long, we'd sell more of it, you know, new stuff. Well, sure, uh, sure. You know. and, um, and but I don't believe that. I, I think the longer the stuff lasts and the more that there's, let's say, a right. second and tertiary market out there for the older, you know, high quality equipment. Yeah. The more people are going to want to come to the new stuff. Well, and especially whenever it's user serviceable for upgrades, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah. I mean, it makes it entirely uh, wantable. And before before we go a little bit deeper with, with that, because I do have one like in the news question for you. Yeah, sure. Um, that, that I want to get to. But before we get to that, um, let's get into some of the new stuff that is coming out from Electrosonics. Mm -hmm. OK, sure, sure. Um, well, the, we've got two interesting platforms, you know, that are recent introductions. And one of those is the Duet digital IEM system which, uh, you know, still amazes me, you know, it came out originally in the fall of 2017. So it's been out there for a little while already, but it still remains the only pro grade digital IEM. And I think that's because of the challenges of doing that. And, um, you know, so I'm proud of that. It's the only IEM that accepts Dante inputs still. Oh, wow. So, you know, it's really carved out a niche for itself, but it, you know, we originally designed it for live sound and, but it's found its way into a bunch of broadcast studios as a, as a IFB. And I think part of the reason there is the spectrum crunch, you know, yep. something we haven't talked about too much, but, you know, I picked a great time to come into the wireless business, you know, uh, <laughs> in 2004, you know, it's like all the spectrum's <laughs> just been yeah. obliterated, you know, and sold off. Uh, and, yep. and so we've had some real, real challenges 
uh, with you know less spectrum available and noisier spectrum at that. So everyone's looking for various solutions. How do I get more channels stuffed into less spectrum? Yeah. Uh, and the Duet, you know, digital IEM system answers that for IFB users because each RF carrier normally, which would carry, you know, one channel of audio or maybe something FM multiplex in the case of most uh, in-ear analog systems, this one carries two discrete channels of digital audio. Uh, so it allows you to use two IFB channels on a single RF carrier with no crosstalk which I think is unique. And, uh, you know, again, wow. people responded really well to that idea. So, you know, essentially it cuts the number of RF carriers in half uh, for your IFB installation. And that can make a big difference in a, in a broadcast studio production environment, for instance. Well, and it, especially in a lot of smaller spaces and a lot of smaller areas that have fewer frequencies will absolutely allow for a wireless IFB. Yeah. Like some of the, some of the places that I've worked broadcast, they were small enough that, yeah, like they would have had so much competing signal That's that right. all, all the IFB was like mine where it's hardwired into the table. That's right. And I mean, look, I, I've said this many times in many seminars, you know, and I will say it again, if it doesn't need to be wireless, don't make it wireless. Sure. You know, it sounds crazy for a wireless manufacturer to say that, but the truth is, we want it to work, you know, and, and we'll advise you, look, for instance, if it's a, a stationary drummer, uh, there's not really a reason to give them a wireless headset mic and a wireless IEM, put yeah. them on a hard line. Same with a keyboard player, you know, if they're mm -hmm. not moving around. And some do. I mean, don't get me wrong. Uh, and, you know, we've seen this explosion in wireless technology in the past 20 years, and it's it's allowed for a complete redesign of how stages look and all the dance stuff that happens on stages, you know. It's fantastic. Uh, we've we've enjoyed being part of that evolution of stage production, uh, but yeah. there's plenty of times when it doesn't really need to be wireless, and it shouldn't be because we've got to save the number of carriers. Sure. And uh, you know, the other concept is give the money channels to the frontline talent, you know, to the to the front people, uh, and others don't necessarily need stereo, or they don't necessarily need, you know, uh, they might be able to share an in-ear mix and things like that. Yeah. Uh, so that that's there's a pecking order to how you handle, you know, all the different kinds of signals that are on a stage. So we're all about that. And I mean, the, the gear is designed to have a lot of flexibility uh, just for that reason. Yeah. And I, once again, the build quality, especially on these, this stuff is absolutely gorgeous. Uh, so aesthetically pleasing. And once again, just milled out of solid metal. Yeah, that's right. Anyone who's come to the factory or seen our, we do have a factory tour. I think it Ooh. was done in 2017 on our YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube slash Electrosonics and look at the uh, factory tour, and kind of go through and see how we build the products from from uh, billet material and raw circuit boards right up to the finished uh, finished products. We do it all in, in one place. Wow. Uh, so yeah, it's great to hear that, you know, that you like the aesthetics and everything. It's definitely got an industrial feel. You know, it's it's not rounded, swoopy plastic. It's yeah. you know, kind of industrial, you know, metal. Uh, but we we do work to make it look nice, feel nice in the hand. Battery doors open with a snap and close with a snap. You know, we want you to have a feeling of confidence yep. uh, when you hold these units in your hand. You know, it, just a little side note. It's one of the things that we uh, were not so happy about doing everything by Zoom. You know, and, mm. and over the phone over the last year and a half. We love it when we have a trade show and people come up and hold the gear. We yeah. have the gear all out in the booth and they can walk up and touch and feel it. And the reaction is always fun to watch. Like, well, wow, I've heard about this stuff, but this feels really good in the hand, you know. That was going to be one of my questions. Was, mm -hmm. And as I told you in the pre-show, as my audience knows, I cover the Texas Association of Broadcasters Industry Trade Show. I go out and do CES where we do three days of eight hours of coverage where it's just... 10 minute interview after 10 minute interview of people with products. Right. Sure. Um, and those uh, that like, that's the industry that I work in is, is the corporate events industry where, you know, it's all trade shows, things like that. And yeah, yeah. they, uh, th this especially um, is such a hand press industry. Uh, whenever it comes to, meeting the lead technicians, things like that. Those are the trade shows that they're going to to see the latest and the greatest. And how is how is that 
affected you guys over the last year, especially with coming out with this new series, the duet system, um, all that kind of stuff? How is how has that affected things? Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I think when the pandemic first hit, you know, we're talking about mm. uh, spring, you know, of 2020, March, April, you know, the NAB broadcast show is our biggest show uh, of the year. And so that show was canceled. Yeah. Normally, we announce new products right around that show. Usually we announce it a couple of weeks ahead of the show just so that people know to come see it at the show. Yep. And it really felt like, you know, shoving these new products off the cliff into the abyss. I mean, you know, we made the announcements yeah. anyway, and there was just no reaction. And I think it makes sense because people were completely overwhelmed with the reality of what was happening. Yeah. Everything was shut down. No, no tours were going out. No theater, no movies were being, everything was shut down. So no one was really interested in new products. And so in a sense, some of the stuff we introduced, including our latest IFB products, uh, really had a very slow uptake. Mm. Again, makes sense, but it was unusual for us to experience that. You know, when, when we launch a product, we have a pretty good idea of what the reaction is likely to be since we design them based on user input and, yeah. you know, uh, people want things to be smaller and they want dock charging and they want such and such features and more presets or whatever. So we do all that. And then it's like, hello, anybody, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so that, that really had an effect. As the year went on, the uh, interest level climbed to the point where by the fall, let's say October or so, we did a product launch um, of a new portable receiver and it was huge new reaction. You know, so I think as recovery was happening, um, the sort of reaction to new products and what we would have done at trade shows uh, improved a lot because that was the only way anyone was finding out anything yeah. was online. You know, they weren't going to shows and seeing it and being like, wow, I didn't even hear about this. You know, yeah. it's like the, they heard about it from our introduction videos and, and our social media presence and seeing it in the press. And that was it. Yeah. So as the world got used to what was happening, things improved. But yeah, there's still that feeling of like, we've we've missed out because people haven't been able to come up and talk to us and have mm. us walk them through the software and, and, and touch and feel the products. Yeah. And just, just that human connection of just, hey, you know, how's it been going? What's new? I mean, you know, those are the kind of conversations we, we love having and, and we enjoy talking to our customers. And I think, yeah. you know, the kind of people we have on our team are, are, are warm, engaging people. Uh, we're, we're, we we're constantly trained to be receptive. You know, people walk in the booth, we greet them, we talk to them, yeah. you know, that's, a, it's an active thing that we do. It's, it's not by accident. And, yeah. uh, so we, we have missed that. We're looking forward to that. And, and of course it's hard to know what's going to happen. I mean, we're all scheduled to go to the NAB show in October in Las Vegas, but we'll see what happens. I mean, <laughs> yeah, you know, we're, fingers we're crossed. planning to be there. We're planning to be there. If well, there's a show, we'll be there. Well, and it's it's like I said during our CES coverage, A, you could not get more CES than to make everybody appear virtually. Right. <laughs> <You> <laughs> yeah, could, exactly. Like, this couldn't be more CES. Um, but at the same time, it's one of those that, yeah, if you're, it's a hand press event. And it's, a, it's an event where if you're set up in the right area, in the right kiosk, like the, the head of Amazon purchasing will come by and go, oh, that's a nice universal remote. We can get these with Amazon on it, right? Right. right. And like, you're done. Yeah. You know, um, it's, it's crazy. And whenever it comes to, let's be straight technicians, when it comes to us nerds, um, it, it's all about the touchy feelies. It it's, is. It's, it's all about like, oh man, feel that. You, even this, like, like you can hear the click on that, um, and the tactile feel of the knob and the way that it moves. Like, you you cannot describe it. It's That's it's right. something that has to be experienced. It's true. It it really is. It's a big part of the brand is the is the experience of yeah. touching and using the equipment, but I also think there's a just a basic human interaction element. Mm. Uh, we, when you have someone there face to face, you're yeah. getting 100% communication happening, which is not available on any other medium. Yeah. I mean, something like Zoom certainly helps versus just talking on a phone or e emailing is one of the worst, you know, but having them, having them there, you can begin to gauge their reaction or interest level to what it is you're 
talking about or showing them, yeah. you know, and it's also like you can get the sense that maybe they want to ask a question, but they're embarrassed or whatever. And so, you know, you can coax it out of them. Mm. There's, there's so many subtle things that can happen in person that really don't go that well yeah. uh, over any other medium. Everything else is a compromise oh, uh, versus in person. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, the, the other question that I had before I let you go, especially with the backward compatibility that you guys have, everything mm-hmm. else, and uh, especially uh, how, how are you guys taking to the news of the, the possible um, right to repair movement that's, hmm, that's well. going on right now? It's, it's, have your engineers had any scuttlebutt about that? Because like, I'm, I'm a tinkerer. I, I own a pedal modification company. Um, for me, it's one of those like, hey, yeah, when I have a piece of gear breakdown, I just crack it open and bust the soldering iron out. Sure, me too. I mean, you know, like I said before, I'm a very hands-on person. I think that's always been part of our philosophy is, mm-hmm. you know, if something uh, quits on you, uh, and you want to open it up and, and tinker a little and see if it's something as simple as, hey, the, you know, the battery wire broke or, you know, there's a internal fuse or maybe this yeah. uh, capacitor across the DC line or whatever is smoked or whatever. Um, and, and you open it up and tinker a little bit and then they say, you know what, I can't handle it, send it in. If that thing's under warranty, it's still under warranty. Exactly. You know, the fact that you opened it uh, doesn't change that. Um, now, if you went in there and did a lot of damage, that, that, you know, yeah, and you know, that's a different story. You've lifted a bunch of traces, and <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. Like, well, now it's gotten into the zone of you really shouldn't have gone that far. Yeah, um, yeah, you know. But we're pretty liberal with um, warranties and and repair. We try to be. I mean, as much as possible, we try to err on the side of of the customer. And, uh, you know, our president's philosophy and the previous one, the same kind of thing, almost like, look, if we're not getting sort of taken advantage of slightly a little bit over the long haul, then then we're not doing a good enough job. We, we, mm. we need to err on the side of the customer as often as possible, you know, with certain limits, of course. You know, when you see yeah. product abuse or when they tell you it's under warranty, I bought it a year ago, and you look and it was made and sold originally three years ago, you know, things like that, you, you just... You know, you have to be, uh, there's there's a line somewhere, but we, we really do lean on the side of trying to help the customer every way we possibly can. Yeah. And uh, like I said, my customer experience, whenever I was in broadcast, things like that uh, with Electrosonics was always top notch and way above standard. Um, I That's never, yeah, uh, yeah. But, but it was also the fact of you rarely had to call Electrosonics. Yeah. Uh, sure. I mean, that's that's the starting point, right? Is we, we don't want to have, <laughs> have to, you know, you you shouldn't have to call us uh, yeah. unless you got a question about, you know, I'm confused about this menu thing. But even there, we spend an enormous amount of time kind of wargaming, you know, menu structures and how easy the product is to use. We, we spend an enormous amount of time working on user manuals. You know, yeah. we just finished one that's uh, for the DCR822. It's our portable two channel digital receiver that's backwards compatible, of course. And because of all the stuff that's packed into it, you know, you hold it up in your hand and you go, this thing is, I don't know, the size of a couple decks of cards, but what it has inside is mind blowing in terms of its sophistication. So the manual is like, it took months and months to get it polished to where we felt like this is representative of electrosonics of what the customers need, you know, but the ultimate goal really is you shouldn't even have to crack it open uh, because the, the menus make sense. And gosh, we spend a lot of time on that and and wrangle it. You know, there's arguments and discussions and, you know, sometimes the president, uh, you know, overrides us or whatever because he just wants it a certain way. And it makes sense because he's got plenty of experience doing this and talking to customers. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's a collaborative effort, as I mentioned before. But, yeah, we don't we don't want you to have to call us because something broke or that you don't understand the product. Uh, but if you do, you'll reach us right away. You will talk to a human on the phone. Yeah. First, there's a receptionist that will answer the phone. And then you say, you know, I want to talk to Carl Winkler because I have a certain question. And I think he might be able to help me. But put me through. And here I am. I'm on the phone with you. And the president's the same. Uh, you know, we've got some fantastic people in our customer service department who can help troubleshoot. Uh, and if they run about, out of ideas, they'll bring engineers into the equation. I mean, that's that kind of a company we we really work hard at that yeah and 
I want to thank you for taking the time to come on and talk about everything that you guys are doing over there. Uh, because once again, I've been a user for years. I've been sold on Electrosonics and sold Electrosonics to installs that I did that were doing broadcasts, that kind of stuff. So Fantastic. Um, yeah. I've, I've been a raging fan of y'all's products for easily half my career. And to, to know that I got to do this interview is a little point of joy for me. Well, it's wonderful. I mean, you know, one thing we didn't really talk about is is the microphones on the live sound side, you know, which we do have and people aren't that familiar with. Well, let's get um, into that if you have time. Yeah, I do. And, you okay. know, what I'd just like to say is that uh, if you are really into sound quality, uh, like I am, uh, I challenge you to put our handheld transmitter with whatever capsule is your favorite capsule, put that up against anything that's out there. You know, you like the Neumann 105? There's an adapter to put it on there. Any one of the sure, the KSM-9, fantastic sounding capsule. Uh, Sennheiser, we have an adapter for those as well because that's a different thread form than the Shure. Mm. Uh, these things sound really, really good on our handheld. And I, and I would say that almost every time I've been there for any shootout, and, and our field guys would say the same thing, uh, it, it's jaw-dropping. I mean, it, you put this thing through the DHU, that's a digital handheld, uh, through our half-rack four-channel receiver, and it's got Dante outs or analog outs, uh, you will be surprised at how good it sounds and how close to a wire it is uh, for your favorite capsule. And most wireless is fairly colored, and this stuff is yeah. very, very open and neutral sounding. So I would just say, you know, we have those products. They're not as well known, uh, but there's some touring bands out there with them, uh, and, uh, you know, they love them. They, they would never go back, the guys that are actually using it. So I'd love to see more uh, stuff there. We can arrange for demos. We got field guys with equipment. I've got a demo rack. Nice. Uh, let's get it out there. Let's get it in front of people. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, the fact that this is a half rack for four units. Yeah. Is insane. Yeah. The the density has always been. I mean, we come at this from stuff's got to be portable. It's got to be lightweight. It's got to be dense. And so our stuff is generally twice as dense rack wise as anyone else's. I mean. The duet system we talked about a minute ago, that's a half rack unit with two stereo transmitters in it. And so you put two of those together and you've got four stereo transmitters in a, in one rack space. Wow. Uh, on the receiver side, you've got in one rack space, eight receiver channels in a rack space. You know, for touring, for fly racks and things like that, there's nothing that's even close to the density. Yeah. Wow. Wow, that is absolutely incredible. And what what has the response been from the people that are using them right now? Who who all do you have out there? If you can say who all out there is using them, what have what have they been saying about them? Yeah, I mean they love them, and and the, you know the bands like Last in Line have been mm -hmm. using them. Uh, I'm trying to think. A great White, who's the, their singer now? Uh, it's escaping me. Um, but uh, he absolutely loves the stuff and just raves about it and posts about it quite often on Instagram. Let's see if I can find him real quick here. And so that gives you some idea. I mean, and there's more than just that. You know, with the guitar players for many years, it was Slash and uh, Carlos Santana. Oh, wow. Uh, Papa Roach. Uh, Eva David Gardner. Uh, I don't. I don't know about... No, it's no not he's him. not the singer anymore. Right. It's bugging me that I can't think of it. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, they they tend to love the stuff and uh, and really uh, just you know, um, it's it's not only the sound quality, but it's it's the reliability of the wireless signal that I think people are surprised with. Uh, yeah. You know, when when they were first kind of getting into this stuff, they would talk about, um, well, don't we need amplified antennas? Don't we need paddles and this and that? Because normally we get dropouts if we go yeah. further than. 50 feet or whatever. And it's like, well, no, but, you know, try it. Um, try it first with just a pair of whips and see what you think. And it's always like, you could not believe how much range we got, you know? Yeah. So Mitch Malloy, that's who I was thinking of. Ah. Mitch Malloy, who's a fantastic singer. You know, if you've ever heard him, I mean, man, talk about the ultimate rock singer. So he's out there with the stuff. There's a handful of bands out there with it. And like I say, they enjoy the range. They enjoy the sound quality. And the uh, the ease of use, in, in, the user interface is super easy. Software is super easy to use. You know, that's the stuff we really focus on. 
Well, and once again, that just comes down straight up to user experience. It does. And and how how people use them in the field, how people, the ease with which they're able to interact with it. Um, even yes. my old unit that I have here, it was as simple as you could get. And if you had a problem, once again, the instructions were right on it. Um, yeah, not exactly. on a sticker like this thing is, man, like the clip broke off long ago. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I still throw this thing in my pocket. I have had it for easily over a decade. Yeah, we made those for something like 15, 16 years, those yeah. units. And it's the most popular unit we've made in terms of the volume of sales for that unit. Wow. There's just tens and thousands of them out there and uh, people love them. I mean, it's stick a battery in it, turn it on and go. It's as yeah. simple as it could be. And uh, yeah, you know, they're, they're, it's a great unit. They've been superseded now. We've got a, a unit that's half that size that does dock charging and sounds even better and even quieter. So uh, we're evolving. But uh, yeah, we love the fact that we've got legacy products out there like that. What What is the typical range of your half rack unit? By range, you mean like distance? Yeah. Uh, you know, that's... Uh, often a factor of what frequencies are available, what the local environment is, mm, but sure. uh, you know, hundred yards isn't uncommon. Uh, wow. I mean, people are using the stuff with that kind of range routinely. I mean, they're, they're putting a transmitter on a referee and having them work at a football field and they could be anywhere on the field and you gotta be picking them up from somewhere in the stands or up in the building, you know yeah. what I mean? Um, and we get regular reports from, from people of ranges far greater than that even. So it really depends. I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't want to say that there's a, a maximum range. You know, in fact, it's one of my pet peeves when people say, you know, range up to 1,200 feet. Yeah. It's like, well, certainly no more than that and probably a lot less. Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? Up, so up we, to, we don't if, advertise if a range. there's no sunlight you know? out and yeah. you're in yeah. a building that has nothing else around it. And <laughs> you, exactly. And under optimal conditions, yes. you know, you're going to get this range. But normally, no. Um, so no, we, we don't typically advertise a range. And, and yeah. the question that people ask often now too, is how many channels can I get in a given amount of spectrum? Mm. And, you know, our latest equipment has a high density mode that is very compact and you can fit easily more than 24 channels into a clean TV, cha you know, TV channel. Wow. Uh, but we don't tell you what the max number is because that's going to be a factor of a lot of other conditions yeah. that could be happening. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's just so many variables with wireless and, that's one of the things that we believe in strongly too. And me personally is education. You know, we do seminars, we do panels, we do workshops, we have instructional videos out there. We're working on a whole education program right now. That's going to be all online and things like that. Yeah. You know, we want an, we want an educated customer, someone who understands the fundamental uh, issues and problems and challenges with wireless so that they don't buy into some of the mythology of wireless and there's plenty of that out there i mean yeah. what i'd like to say is it, this isn't voodoo and black magic it's math and science and physics and those rules don't change you know as science learns more and we come up with more clever algorithms we might be able to get more channels into a you know piece of spectrum and things like that but the laws of physics propagation you know uh that stuff doesn't change you know we're, we're all up to the same constraints you know, yeah. range is a factor of power and frequency and cleanliness of the channel. And that's about it. You know, every, all things being equal, your range will be equal as long as your equipment's well designed, things like that. Yeah. So we, we really work hard to uh, get those messages out there by various means. Well, and with that in mind, what what's next? What's on the horizon for Electrosonics? What can you what can you let us in on? Let's say that, because I, I know that so often when it comes to development of things, you, you can't really speak on any of it. Um, but, you know, what are what are some of the concepts, ideas that you are able to speak on? Yeah, well, I, I would say that most of what we do is some form of evolutionary development. Um, and by that, I mean, if you are familiar with our product line and what you know components make up a, a system and things like that, you can probably guess, you know, what's coming next. And so I can't really talk about specific products that might be out next. Yeah. But I will say that, you know, the development team is uh, often goes back and forth between coming up with new products, which we've had a bunch of recently, 
uh, like the ones I talked about, and refinement, which means that they do primary research on algorithms, on modulation schemes, on you know circuit topology, and what what chips are available. You know, you mentioned the chip shortage, and that's thrown everybody a curveball. Uh, certainly us yeah. where, you know, let's say we had a certain product plan in mind and we were going to come out with new stuff and then chip shortages come along. And so what it means is uh, a, a bunch of products had to be redesigned to not include chips we were using and use alternative alternate parts. Yeah. And that slows things down. But these guys are always looking at what's a better A to D converter that uses less power and has less distortion and is faster and reduces latency, you know, and they'll be introducing those things into products as we go along. And you see that the latency of our systems have come down just, you know, 10th of a millisecond by 10th of a millisecond as we go. And, you know, we've got some of the lowest latency digital products on the market at 1.2 yeah. to 1.4 milliseconds. It's incredibly fast. Wow. So, uh, the guys are always working on that kind of thing. You know, how can uh, dropout performance be improved? How can diversity be improved? How can the noise figure be lowered? How can sensitivity be improved? And so, like I mentioned before, I mean, a product might be on the market for eight or 10 or 15 years, depending. And in that life, often they improve tremendously from beginning to end. And if it's a major revision, we'll let people know that, yeah, it's a board upgrade that you got to do. And you know, if it's within this certain time frame, it's it's a free upgrade. If it's older than that, it's this cost, usually at our cost. But many times, it's just a, a, a firmware update. And the la the products we've come out with in the last five to six years have USB jacks right on them. So that allows you to do an upgrade yourself by just loading the latest firmware in there. And, you know, we fix bugs along the way as well. So. You know, that's one thing that first question in our mind, what firmware, you know, when they call up, I'm having this problem. Well, what firmware is in your unit? Well, it's this. Okay, up, update it and your problem goes away. You know, we've, yeah. we've found that to be an issue and we've corrected it in the latest version. So th that's the main thing that I would say we're working on right now is uh, refining every aspect of the products that we have out there, you know, from mechanical designs to electrical designs and software that goes in them. Uh, it's that's a, a big process we've been into lately. Well, refined is definitely the word that I would use whenever the word electrosonics comes to mind, because they are such a laser focused product for the task at hand and so amazing. Uh, once again, Carl, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to come on. Where can where can people go uh, to purchase le electrosonics? Where can they go to find their local electrosonics distributor or dealer, things like that. Yeah. Get shameless. Uh, right. Uh, certainly uh, our, our dealership, we sell direct to dealers. We don't have distributors. Uh, but just about anywhere in the world, uh, if it is a film sound specialty shop, uh, that's the most common place to find electrosonics and find them in, available for rentals. Uh, some of the major touring companies, Claire, uh, for instance, has electrosonics inventory. Um, and then there's some specialized shops uh, that, that do sound installation, like you mentioned doing some of that work yourself. Mm -hmm. So uh, I would say if you're in an in a area and you want to know where to find an electrosonics dealer, just give us a buzz on the phone, send us an email, come to the website and, and you know, send us a note. And we'll let you know what the, the nearest electrosonics dealers are. And you can always reach us by various means. We're, we're on Facebook. We're very active there. We've got a company page, but we've also got a couple different groups that you're welcome to join that have thousands of members and tons of helpful conversations go on in there. Uh, so lots of places to to reach us and encounter us, and um, we're, we're responsive to your questions. Well, you have been more than responsive to our questions today, and once again, thank you so much for taking the time out uh, to come on, talk about the latest and greatest coming out with you guys. Uh, you are always welcome. My audience and airwaves are yours. So whenever you have new stuff, please don't hesitate to give a shout. We'd love to have you back on again and again and again, Carl. I appreciate it, Chris, and I've enjoyed it, and uh, have a great one, and thanks again. Absolutely. Please do hold the line while we close things out. While you are online checking out everything that is Electrosonics at Electrosonics.com, make sure to stop on by the Talking Sound podcast that is where you can find all the episodes. That's where you can find the industry news section that is being rebuilt. 
make sure to stop on by the HC Universal Network as well. Until next time, everybody, take care of yourselves. Take care of your hearing. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you Bye-bye. for tuning in to this episode of the Talking Sound Podcast. For more episodes, industry news, and information, visit us online at TalkingSoundPodcast.com. Subscribe to the Talking Sound Podcast on Amazon Audible, Spotify, Spreaker, SoundCloud, iTunes, or your favorite podcast service. Get the latest Talking Sound videos on Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, Reach TV, or your Roku or Amazon Fire device with the APR TV app. Talking Sound is a proud member of the HC Universal Network family of podcasts. For more great shows and content, subscribe to hcuniversalnetwork.com today. Until next time, watch those meters, gig safely, and keep reaching for 11. This is Talking Sound.